and uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. It's wonderful to have you with us again. Uh, my name is Karen Smith. I'm a technical advisor at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and I'm going to be facilitating today's seminar along with my colleague from PNNL, Nick Chafuku, and our colleague from the IAEA, Horst Munken Fernandez. Uh, today's seminar is jointly hosted by PNNL's Center for the Remediation of Complex Sites. Remplex, and also Environet, the IAEA's network on environmental remediation and norm management. And PNNL and IAEA collaborate on a number of initiatives uh, to expand the value and impact of those activities um, within our parallel networks. And, and this seminar today is one such collaborative offering. Uh, before I turn things over to Horst to say a couple of words, I want to acknowledge our PNNL colleague, colleagues Kelly McIntosh and Melissa Perdue. They help us a great deal in organizing and promoting these events. And for your information, the seminar is being recorded. We'll be making a recording as well as a copy of the slides available after the seminar uh, on our website and uh, IAEA's website. Please uh, mute your microphones during our presentations. And um, thank you, Horst. I'm going to turn it over to you for a few remarks. Yes, uh, thank you, Karen. I will not take uh, long. We have a very uh, busy agenda ahead of us with very interesting presentations. I'd like to uh, greet uh, Nick uh, Vocal, our panelists, Grace and Tansen and all the supporting people back in uh, PNNL for this uh, meeting and all our audience, which is increasing by the, the second. So uh, it's very rewarding to see that uh, whatever we have to offer it attracts uh, interest. So as Karen said, uh, we have a practical arrangement, a collaboration uh, with uh, PNNL. And the idea here is to enhance the um, international uh, community, enhance the, share, the sharing of uh, information and knowledge to the international community by means of uh, different types of uh, activities, such as this webinar. Um, many of you, you remember that specifically during the years of the pandemic, we entertained a lot of uh, webinars, almost monthly webinars uh, under the Environet. But I guess that uh, this uh, partnership with uh, PNNL and Remplex uh, adds a lot of value, a lot of uh, great importance in terms of uh, what it brings uh, along, specifically with a uh, broader, um, broader uh, spectrum of experts that for sure will uh, bring you some valuable information. So I'm very uh, proud of uh, being co-organizer of this uh, uh, webinar with Karen PNNL, and I hope that you will enjoy. We will be taking the questions, and I hope for a very active uh, discussions uh, towards the the overall uh, implementation of the, the webinar. So Karen, back to you. Okay, and actually I I'm gonna turn it over to you, Nick. Yes. I believe uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Definitely, good morning everyone from the Pacific Northwest in the United States. Um, I would like to um, announce and introduce very briefly our global summit that will be held in November 13th to 17th at the Pacific Northwest uh, National Laboratory here in Richland, in the state of Washington. Um, we are excited this year because we will have an in-person meeting, uh, but we will also offer a virtual component. So if you are not able to, tra to travel, you can still attend our meeting uh, virtually. We have a very, very rich program uh, of activities. We have three case studies. We have a total of nine technical sessions and uh, we will have a general poster presentation session. And of course, we will have the historic, the famous historic Hanford tour. And uh, we will offer a variety of workshop and training workshops as well. Um, currently, the abstract uh, submission is open. So I will encourage every one of you to consider submitting uh, an abstract to this meeting. We would love to have you here uh, in Richland. And um, the link, you know, how to submit the abstract is now provided in the, in the, in the chat box. Um, so we will really hope to see everyone here in Richland for this global summit. Thanks again. Thanks for, for joining us today. Karen, back to you. 
Great. Thank you, Nick. Uh, yeah, I, I want to say we're giving you an early announcement that we're extending the abstract deadline to June 20th. So we'll be we'll be rolling out that announcement, sharing that with uh, the larger universe um, by email this week. And uh, I just want to make sure you can see the slide, but you can't see my Word file with my notes. Is that correct? I want to be sure I'm not sharing the no. wrong thing. Okay, no, good. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So great. Um, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Horst. And so now we'll turn our attention to today's seminar. This is a kind of interesting and new for us. This is the first of a two-part seminar series focusing on assessing environmental remediation technologies. Uh, there are a lot of different technology options for remediating contaminated groundwater, soils, sediments, and at any given site, the, the process of selecting the most appropriate uh, remediation approach is going to be driven by a variety of factors, environmental factors, technical, economic, social, regulatory, and policy-driven factors. So today we're going to focus first on groundwater remediation technologies. And then the second part of this series will be held, the seminar will be held in August, August 15th. And that one we will focus on the remediation of soils and sediments. We have three speakers today and uh, they're shown here on our slide. Um, each of them will present on a different aspect of groundwater remediation. And then we hope to take one or two questions after each individual presentation. And uh, please put those questions in the chat. Uh, our goal then is to have an open period at the end of this seminar where we can have general discussion across the topic. And I'll start first uh, with our first speaker, Christian Johnson. And Chris, feel free to share, take over the screen. Chris is a, a chemical engineer by training. He works at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He's been at PNNL since 1992. And uh, he's involved in, sorry, lost my script. He's been involved in uh, work focused on environmental restoration and remediation, the technologies, research and development. He's designed uh, and implemented multiple ex situ and in situ bioremediation systems for treating hydrocarbons and chlorinated solvents, developed reactive transport code, authored guidance on various aspects of um, remedy evaluation, and developed uh, remediation decision support tools. So Chris is going to speak today as sort of a broad introductory and overview presentation on the factors to consider in groundwater remedy selection. So I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Karen. So yeah, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, technology selection and remedy selection uh, for groundwater. Uh, so I'm going to go through uh, some information about regulatory frameworks, talk about the environmental remediation process and how an in-state division fits in there, um, talk about actual technology selection, including what kind of technologies are, are available, um, bring in the site setting and conceptual site model as key pieces of information, and then look at some of the additional factors uh, with a few examples and sprinkle throughout. You're going to have some references here for, for information uh, to look up for more details. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by talking about some regulatory frameworks. And, and again, I work in the United States, so this is kind of what I know. Um, uh, I'll, I'll kind of talk about these a little bit. I think international frameworks, Europe, Asia, elsewhere, are going to be slightly different in terms of terminology and nuances. But the overall um, approach should be the same. And so I think the, the, the approach and sort of the themes that we talk about today are relevant to everybody um, in the audience. So <clears throat> the regulatory framework really provides some structure for looking at the environmental remediation process in terms of documents and approvals and what are the steps and what, what's all involved. Uh, in the United States, we have CERCLA, uh, which is otherwise known as Superfund. That's uh, one of the major programs, but there's other programs such as RECRA or TUSCA or UMTRA, UMTRA Foods Wrap, BRAC, and FUDS, uh, all defined here. And they're just different programs depending on who owns the site and or maybe what kind of contamination is there. You know, there's one particularly for uranium mill tailings, for example. So that kind of sets sets the context uh, for what we're going to look at. So, the United States Environmental Protection Agency or EPA. Uh, has certain expectations under CERCLA. Um, basically, we want to use some treatments uh, to address the principal threats wherever possible, right? Treatments were the, the first 
uh, first approach, engineering controls are also relevant, particularly if things are sort of lo low level, long-term threats um, or where treatment's just not um, something that can be implemented. Um, you can, most of the time, and maybe a lot of you realize this, that you might use a combination of methods, right? It may not just be one thing, it may be a couple of different approaches, really trying to achieve the protection of human health and the environment is the ultimate goal here. Institutional controls would be another uh, administrative approach uh, that can supplement uh, treatment or engineering controls. And it's really about uh, controlling access to limit exposure. Um, innovative technology should be considered when it, you know, it has the potential to offer, you know, if the same performance or better, uh, or it might be more implementable, uh, it might have fewer side effects from from the technology and there's possible uh, it might have a lower cost right so it doesn't hurt to be innovative um, so we need to consider that and then finally EPA would like to see groundwater re return to their beneficial use um, they they recognize that you know it's going to be some based on sites particular site circumstances um, and they, they recognize that they're trying to do things in a reasonable time frame as well so a remedy selection under CERCLA, they're super fun. It has a process with nine criteria they've established. Uh, this has been around for a long time. Um, and I, you'll see here a couple of the references, right? Some rules of thumb and some key principles. Uh, so the, the nine criteria, there, there's two threshold criteria. So these are sort of the main, if you're gonna do remediation, you gotta do these things, right? Uh, you gotta protect human health and the environment. Uh, you gotta comply with the, um, regulations. There's balancing criteria that span a couple of kinds of effectiveness and you're reducing toxicity, et cetera, implementability cost. And then we have some modifying criteria, uh, which they, they've categorized the uh, state and community acceptance as those. So I'm going to touch on each of these really briefly, just so you know, what, what does that mean? Protection of human health and the environment, for example. Um, we're really trying to protect exposure um, will have uh, some risk identified with contamination. And so how can that contamination be eliminated or reduced or controlled? Again, it's through the treatment engineering or institutional controls. We're trying to take care of this, this problem, this, this uh, contamination in the environment. The ARARs, you know, we're trying to meet uh, environmental regulations. So we want to do that. Long-term effectiveness and permanence. So permanence comes into here over the long term, can we maintain this protection reliably over time? And want to think about any kind of residuals. You know, if you don't clean up quite everything, there's still a little bit left there. You know, is there going to be any what kind of impact from that? Um, or were you just not able to treat a certain certain zone or, or maybe a contaminant? Uh, short term effectiveness really looks like how 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 can we get out there and implement a remedy? Uh, how long is it going to take? What are the impacts to the workers and the community? Um, you know, both during construction and operation of a remedy. The reduction in toxicity, mobility, or volume through treatment. That's pretty self-explanatory. And there's a preference for, for technologies that can do those things uh, versus some of the engineering controls, right? Implementability, what's, uh, how feasible is this thing, this remedy to implement um, you know, do we have the right materials and resources? Um, is, is, is it reliable, right? Cost, clearly uh, cost comes into, play, comes into play here. It's a resource, right? We have to have the right resources to implement uh, a remedy. And then there's state and community acceptance that uh, the, the regulators and the folks around that site should have some input onto the, into the remedies and, and what's going on in the cleanup. So this is a, some diagrams for the environmental remediation process, or at least a piece of it on the bottom here. Um, again, you've got the EPA guidance for, for CERCLA, uh, and I'm also gonna point at Summers, uh, and you'll see the reference in the lower right there. So traditionally, the remediation process has been sort of listed as a linear process. It's got some interconnections, there's a little bit of iteration. Um, we're really interested in for today into in the piece here on screening of alternatives or technologies 
And how do we how do we come up with a remedy? What's what's the right remedy for our site? If you look at the Summers document or uh, guidance from uh, folks like Itric on adaptive site management, you get a, a picture that's more more like the circular diagram over here, where the whole process is iterative and and integrated. Uh, it's not a linear process. You, you're going to come back as you get new information, and uh, and adjust adjust that uh, potentially adjust the remedy. There is definitely a, a remedy selection piece in here, which I circled. And so again, we're gonna talk about that today. So one thing that um, is not explicitly listed in CERCLA is an end state vision. And I think this is, you know, over time as we've done remediation, we've learned more, we've adjusted uh, sort of the perspectives and end state vision, I think is really kind of an important piece here. Uh, and, and this is this is kind of a, a definition or a description where you're really looking for an, a risk-informed remedy that's going to protect human health and the environment. So same same stuff, right? But uh, let's be inclusive of, of regulatory community, tribal nation, and other stakeholder acceptance. Um, be respectful of equity and you know environmental justice. Uh, thinking about climate resilience. I think we're all seeing. The interesting things going on with climate. And so we have to be resilient to that. And we need to look at things like time and budget factors. Those, those play a role in how fast can we get things done and what resources do we have? Uh, we're looking for something that's sustainable in terms of operations, maintenance, um, long-term monitoring costs, potential future, future migration, and et cetera, over the management life cycle for the site. And in, in uh, at least for in the United States, uh, for Department of Energy, uh, we want to be able to transfer the site to the appropriate entity for long-term stewardship or beneficial use. Right? So the technology selection process. So this is, I've kind of listed out the typical steps here. Um, you're going to say, well, what kind of technologies are available? And you really want to try and be inclusive and unbiased at this point. And then you're going to do some screening based on the site setting and the contaminants. And there's different contaminant types, uh, you might have radionuclides at your site, you might have a mixture. Um, so you're gonna screen and say, well, what can, what can apply or what multiple technologies can apply to this site? Uh, there may be some that are just not appropriate. Just don't make any sense. Uh, they're not gonna do any, anything in terms of remediation because they're not designed for that setting or contaminants, right? But I would say keep technologies that are borderline, again, to sort of avoid, avoid bias or prejudgment um, you know, don't have your own pet technology, right? You want to be comprehensive in, in what you're considering. Then you go into a technology screening phase where you're going to identify what, what are we talking about in terms of zones? Am I treating a, a source or a plume core? Um, what are some potential strategies, such as volumetric treatment or a treatment uh, with a PRB, a permeable reactive barrier? Um, then you'll want to rank technologies based on Three, we typically look at three things, effectiveness, implementability, and relative cost. Okay. Uh, and then uh, after the, after you down select and say, well, here's some alternatives, you're gonna evaluate uh, the remedial alternatives in more detail um, you know, in terms of a preliminary design and what's the cost and what do you, what's more information about effectiveness? Uh, how, how might we combine these different technologies to address the entire groundwater plume or, and, and potentially source? Um, and you may need to do some treatability testing to fill some gaps. Um, you make sure that your technology is going to work at your site. So <clears throat> here are a list of some technology resources. Uh, these are things that I use. And so FRTR uh, is a great resource. The EPA Clue in another great resource and a couple others. Uh, the Superfund Remedy Report says here's a bunch of technologies that have been used over the last 20, 20 some years. Um, CPO Tech Tree, another, another resource. If you want information on what is the technology, what technologies are out there, these are good resources for you. And they're going to lead you to a list like this. So here's a bunch of technologies. Uh, I've categorized them by different types. There's removal, uh, containment, biological, chemical, physical, thermal, and then attenuation. And so these are sort of the broad technology names. There's, there's going to be a lot of nuances um, in situ bioremediation, you, there's a bunch of different substrates. You could do molasses or lactate or vegetable oil, right? So there's a lot of nuances to these, but these are sort of the, the main 
technology headings. Um, so these are kind of the kind of things you're going to look at and say, well, what, what applies to my site? If I've got a strontium-90 uh, contamination, well, I'm probably not going to use air sparging because uh, air sparging is for volatile contaminants, right? Um, but I could use uh, sequestration to an appetite, uh, put an appetite permeable reactive barrier and sequester uh, strontium. So it really kind of depends on your site, contaminants, uh, where you head with this. I'm also going to briefly touch on ex situ treatment technologies. Um, so if you have a remedy, uh, particularly something like pump and treat, for example, you know, you're extracting groundwater, trying to control uh, and capture a groundwater contaminant plume, but you need the, some kind of ex situ above ground treatment technology to remove it from the water, uh, to reduce the volume or destroy it, right? That's reduce the mobility, toxicity, volume. Um, but you could also have something like uh, air sparging, where you need to capture the vapor and treat the vapor, right? And uh, you treat the vapor with granule activated carbon. Now you have a solid phase. So these ex situ treatment technologies are part of the remedial alternatives to make sure you're treating every piece and you have a good disposition. It's either destroyed or you, you have a, a way to release it or you're going to have a, a disposal facility, right? How are you going to disposition? all the waste uh, throughout the process. <clears throat> so I'm gonna to briefly touch on two slides here. Um, our, our third speaker is gonna talk a little bit, a little bit more detail on these, um, but as you're considering technologies, you ought to be looking at things like remediation amendments. Do I have to inject something into the subsurface, whether it's liquid, gas, or particulates, and how's that gonna work, right? Uh, what kind of what kind of subsurface access do I need and, and can I get at my site? Um, there's a variety of technologies from in wells or in direct push points, um, some jetting, you could do in situ soil making, mixing. Uh, if it's near surface, you could do excavation or trenching. Um, you might use things like hydraulic or pneumatic fracturing to open up cracks and get a better distribution of amendments. And then you're also thinking about the treatment strategies. Do I do I have contamination and, and set up uh, you know, a plume in such a way that I can use a treatment wall, a permeable reactive barrier? Do I need to treat the entire volume, right? Um, are there things I can do in terms of induced gradients or in-well circulation or different operational strategies that can help me, right? So you're thinking about these different aspects as you're thinking about potential technologies applicable to your site. So one of the key things uh, for selecting technologies, contaminants, you know, something about technologies, you need to know about your site. What's what's the site conceptual model, a conceptual site model? And that involves uh, several things here. Uh, scale, you know, how big is the plume? Uh, length, overall magnitude, depth. Uh, what does the geology look like in the subsurface? What kind of aquifer properties do we have? Does those drive things like the groundwater flow? How fast is the groundwater flow? Uh, what kind of minerals are there? So you might have sorption or redox reactions going on. Uh, what's the hydrology look like? Um, do you have bounding, uh, boundary conditions such as a, a river that the stage fluctuates, um, infiltration and recharge to the subsurface? Um, again, we talked about the contamination, but you know, where is the contamination? Do you have a source? What's that distribution look like? Um, and where are your receptors? You know, what are you protecting here uh, in terms of things like drinking water wells or surface water bodies, right? So all these go into your uh, conceptual site model and help help guide you to what you need to do when you're in your uh, technology selection, right? And I'll just throw up the sort of an anatomy of a, a contaminated site for groundwater. Uh, typically, you're going to have something that looks like this, and not, not everybody's going to be the same, but just in general, you're going to have a waste site that had a release. Uh, there's a, so there's a source zone, right? Then there's a, a primary plume, higher concentrations, and then you might have a much larger uh, dilute plume, plume or fringe. So this might be where, as you're selecting technologies, you say, well, I need a technology that's going to address the source. And maybe I also need a technology that's going to address the, the dissolved phase plume um, more broadly, right? So what, what are the target zones? This comes into play as you're doing that screening of, 
you know, here's a list of technologies. Um, some of them might be appropriate for the these this zone. Some might be appropriate for the other zone. So you might end up with a couple of parallel paths there as you're looking at technologies. So I'm going to go through a couple little examples here. Um, Hanford has a large carbon tetrachloride plume. So this is this is based on some work by Truex et al. from 2006 as a report, a uh, PNL report that talked about uh, the carbon tet plume and looked at technology screening and how do we select the technology. Um, so the setting here, the, the uh, depth to the water table, about 100 meters. It's a, a large plume at the time. They, they quantified it about 2,700 acres for the five microgram per liter contour. And uh, went through that, you know, again, put that list of big, long list of technology together and said, well, what can we screen out? And, and things like uh, grout walls. Uh, we're not going to install a grout wall at 100 meter depth, and we're not going to do phytoremediation, right? So this, those just get tossed out uh, at the start of things. And then we went through a screening process, and the screening process asked some questions, specific questions about effectiveness, implementability, and cost to look at uh, what technologies might be most appropriate. In this case, they ended up retaining uh, pump and treat, monitor natural attenuation, uh, in-situ bioremediation, and redox manipulation. But things like in-well airstripping were not retained because too many wells were needed, right? So it was at a lower implementability and a higher cost. And so these, these other ones were retained for, for the full remedial alternatives analysis. Uh, again, where you go into that preliminary design and come up with a, a preferred remedy. So another case that, that's going to kind of hit on a little bit different point here, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord over in Tacoma, Washington, they have TCE contamination. That uh, there's there's actually two aquifers. You get uh, a picture down the lower uh, right here. There's an upper aquifer. There's actually a hole between an aquitard and uh, a lower aquifer. And they were interested in determining what technology to use for this lower aquifer contamination. Uh, it's in the what's called the sea level aquifer. So the same kind of screening process was applied here, um, and they came up with some remedial alternatives. Uh, again, they're, they're looking at uh, what kind of technology can be put in place to prevent this lower aquifer plume from reaching some um, the site boundary. And then there's some water, water wells, uh, the red dot here, and then the, that lines the site boundary. And so pump of treats was, came up in well air stripping, institute anaerobic biobarrier, and then no action was included for, for comparison. We'll, we'll typically do that to say, well, if we did nothing, what, what's going to happen, right? Um, so uh, one of the things that th was interesting about this site was that um, there's a Madigan Army Medical Center nearby, uh, up maybe basically right under, under the red plume here. Um, and they pumped water out of wells to use for cooling water. And so this was the thing, it, was, it wasn't the, a deciding factor, but it was a, an interesting factor to say, well, if we did pump a treat, we could beneficially use that water, right? We can pump it out, treat it, and put it to use as cooling water for the medical center, right? So think about things like that. Are there other maybe uh, factors that, that might tip uh, things in favor for one particular technology, right? So another example I'll go into is uh, Tuba City. This is a Department of Energy site uh, under the Office of Legacy Management. Um, you know, the, the end state vision here, they, they define that. They want to protect the quality and quantity of groundwater in the Navajo Aquifer uh, at the site. And so they had a, a, a remedy in place uh, that they use pump a treat with distillation and then injection back in the aquifer. The, the distillation uh, wasn't being very effective. So they went to an interim treatment of pump and treat with an evaporation pond. Um, the, the issue here was, was you know, protect the quality and quantity, right? So here's where the stakeholders bring in their perspective and say, this water is important to us. If you just evaporate it, we're losing that water. And, and that's, that's not what we want, right? We want to keep that water in the system. So, so that groundwater remedy is being revised. Um, the Department of Energy National Labs have provided some recommendations. So they're 
working through some different options to to find a, a better remedy uh, based on technical input on there. But again, the stakeholder important input was really important for this. Another another thing that's not really captured in the circular um, guidance are, are things like green, sustainable, and resilient remediation. Right? There's a lot of information out there. Put some references up here uh, for the EPA Greener Cleanups Initiative. ITRIC, the Interstate Re Technology and Regulatory Council, has uh, several guidance documents on their website. Folks like the NAVFAC, Naval Facilities Engineering Command, they've got some guidance and they actually have a piece of software to look at uh, green and resilient remediation. And they've, they've mapped these GSR metrics to the circular criteria and said, well, here's, here's how these things cross correlate. And this is something that can be applied throughout the remediation process. Again, as you're selecting technologies, think about, okay, well, if I use a thermal technology, that's going to be more ex expensive. Uh, you know, a lot of electricity versus using something that's uh, maybe a bioremediation has a smaller footprint in terms of the GSR uh, metrics. So, and, and here's actually an example. <clears throat> so, enhanced bioremediation, it's got you know some emissions, energy usage, air emissions, etc. It's looking at different technologies: the bioremediation, chemical oxidation, chemical reduction. Uh, electrical resistive heating and excavation, right? And so again, heating, it's got the, the, the thermal components, a lot of electrical usage. So it's got some red, red markers here in terms of its metrics, GSR metrics. So this is something that, that we now need to th be thinking about as we're selecting technologies. How can we have uh, a lower footprint, more something more sustainable? <clears throat> so just in summary, we're trying to make some decisions about technologies based on the context of the conceptual site model, what contaminants do we have, what's the regulatory framework, looking at some key factors like effectiveness, implementability, and cost. But you know, fundamentally, we need to protect the human health and environment. Right? We need to have the regulatory community, tribal nation, other stakeholder acceptance. These people are, are live nearby or, or you know, they have vested interest. They need to be involved in the decisions because they bring interesting perspectives that go beyond just a, a technical, can I clean it up? Is it, can I destroy this contaminant? And we need to respect the equity, environmental justice, climate resilience. Uh, as climate changes, we need to look at how, how can we have a resilient technology for the long term, right? And then there's time and budget factors, and we need to be sustainable um, in terms of operations, monitoring, and protectiveness. And so that's that's all I have. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, that was a great overview. There's an awful lot of information to, to mine there. Um, we didn't have any questions in the chat, but I wanted to ask you uh, one question, and maybe it relates to the matrix you showed about the sustainable green, resilient, sustainable um, technology selection. Um, you have all these criteria. How do you balance, how, how do you approach uh, balancing different objectives, different uh, priorities among your stakeholders in the technology selection. When you have competing interests, uh, can you just say a word or two about that? Yeah, I think I think that's really where um, the end state vision can play a, a big role, right? Uh, the circular has got a piece that says, well, does the community accept this? But the whole concept of the end state vision um, where you get together and you have these conversations about what are your values? Um, you know, as an engineer, my value is I'm, I'm trying to clean up the contamination, right? Um, but you saw with the Tuba City, water's important to the tribal nations, right? So they bring a different perspective and you have to, you know, initiate that early and, and have that open communication to, to look at um, the values and how do we come to an agreement on an appropriate path forward with a remedy. Great. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, Horst, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You there? Yeah. You mentioned that potentially we could ask two questions. I just yeah. want to have one to the burning one. Uh, you mentioned a different criteria, Chris, in terms of uh, your uh, selection, technology selection. You marginally talk about waste, right? So for some uh, extra uh, in situ treatment um, technologies, uh, how do you factor waste or is just not an uh, important thing to, to look at because the amount that 
would be generated are not that important. How well, do you... no, the, like the, you're talking about like secondary waste uh, as you, you're treating the, the contamination in the groundwater, right? So, I mean, that's definitely important and part of the process. And that's whole part of the, uh, you know, they reduce the toxicity, mobility and volume, right? You can't just transfer it from one media to another. You want to really want to reduce that or destroy it. And so that'll come into play as you're looking at technologies, particularly in the alternatives evaluation, where you're getting a little more detail of which technologies are going to produce more waste. Is this something where I have a stream that I have to dispose of, right? Or, um, you know, would I need to inject some water back in the aquifer or release it to the surface water? And can I get permits for those? Those, those factors are, are definitely important as you're considering technologies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. sure. And a very brief question, Chris. Uh, you mentioned that how important are the site-specific characteristics. Right. Um, can you can you list some of them that are really really very important as compared to some others? <laughs> well, the, <laughs> they can all be important. It depends right. on, on the site, right? Um, I didn't really get into complex sites, but that's a whole other aspect here. A right. site can be very complex, and that's the hydrogeology. Um, you know, the contaminants, if you have mixed contaminants. Mm -hmm. um, I think things like heterogeneity, um, you know, what's, if you're dealing with metals or radionuclides, you know, the um, geochemistry could be really important. So it, it depends on on the, the contaminants. Um, I don't know. I think I think you, that's part of the conceptual site model, right? Is you have to put something together that says, "Here's what conceptually describes our site in terms of groundwater flow and the composition and contaminants and extents, and and use that uh, to identify the key processes and features that that you need to focus on uh, as you're considering technologies." Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Certainly. Okay, great. Horst, uh, should we go on to our next presentation? Um, <clears throat> yes, Karen, thank you very much. And thank you, thank you. for Chris for his uh, presentation. So I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Vitek Vokal. I uh, hope that I'm pronouncing his name uh, properly. Um, Vitek uh, was born in on September 2nd, 1979 in Liberec, that is the Czech Republic. So in 2004, he graduated from the Technical University in Liberec with a specialization in mathematical modeling, definitely something that is key for uh, remediation of groundwater. Uh, in 2004, he started his professional career at Diamo, the state enterprise Strasford Ralsken in the field of uranium mining and environmental remediation. In the beginning, as a mathematical modeling a specialist in the branch of a uh, enterprise and international cooperation specialist, uh, sorry, in the beginning in the, uh, the branch of uranium mining and processing stress pod, pod Halskem. Uh, and then since 2018, he has been working at Diamo State Enterprise as international cooperation specialist and that as a lecturer of International Training Center World Nuclear University School of Uranium Production. Actually a very interesting um, training opportunity that some of our uh, guests today might be willing to pay attention to. So as an expert of the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, he participated in the 2019 mission to Bulgaria, focused on remediation of consequences after uranium mining. Today, um, <clears throat> Vokal will talk about a case study on groundwater remediation related to in-situ leaching uranium mining at the Strasbourg Halskem deposit in Czech Republic. Just to add to that, that uh, we have recently a conference in uh, IAEA, uh, something like two weeks ago about uranium mining. And it has been uh, mentioned that in-situ leaching is uh, the most likely option to produce uranium in the years to come due to the uh, lower investments in the uh, and capital costs to establish uranium mining. So, uh, that brings a lot of uh, importance and a lot of relevance, additional relevance to what um, Vocal has to share with us. So Vocal, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you Horst for introduction. Uh, 
yes, you are right. ISL is quite good method, but it must be done properly. Uh, so uh, good morning, everybody in uh, US. Uh, good evening here in Europe. Uh, I will talk now about the uh, remediation uh, after in-situ leaching in uh, the Czech Republic. And uh, I will talk also about the mistakes we made during the uh, ISL leaching period. So let's go uh, really briefly to the uh, general introduction of our state enterprise. The AMO is, uh, was founded in uh, 1946 after uh, Second World War uh, as a uranium mines uh, national enterprise. Uh, during uh, for 40, 50 years of uh, exploration of the whole uh, Czech Republic, we found the thousands of radiometric anomalies and uh, then uh, evaluation of uh, 186 uh, deposits uh, led to uh, the mining at 86 deposits uh, over a whole Czech Republic. Uh, during the uh, 70 years of mining, uh, we produced uh, more than 130,000 tons of uranium in metal. And we used in the Czech Republic uh, all types of mining. It, means underground mining, open pits, and ISL in one deposit. Uh, so now to one of the biggest uh, ecological burden in the Czech Republic, which is the uh, removing of consequences after uh, in-situ leaching uranium uh, in the northern part of Czech Republic. Uh, the deposit is there where the violet arrow shows you. So in the northern part, uh, which is here, uh, I think, really important is the uh, green line, which shows the Bohemian Cretaceous Basin. And this is one of the biggest sources of drinking water uh, in Europe. And uh, there is about 3 billion cubic meters of, of uh, drinking water. Uh, and there, in the middle of this, of this uh, basin, uh, we use uh, uh, acid leaching for, to, to extract uranium from the underground, which caused a lot of problems for us. Uh, the uh, exploration of, the, uh, of this part of the Czech Republic started in 1962 uh, after some, uh, some airplane um, exploration. Uh, we drilled the first well in Hamranejzeře and by uh, logging of this well we found the uranium there it started massive exploration uh and ne in next uh four or five years we found there uh, the main sites hammer osechna strash and krzyżany uh we uh used there uh two different types of mining it means uh deep mining and uh, in situ leaching so I will focus now on the in-situ leaching, which started uh, in 1966 with first leaching experiments. And the official start of chemical mining or in-situ leaching was in 1974. Uh, the highest production, the maximum we extracted in uh, 1977, uh, more than uh, 850 tons of uranium. Uh, the remediation, uh, started in 1996, and the remediation is really a long, a long lasting process. So I will focus now on the remediation. Uh, the total uranium production by in situ leaching was 15,000 tons of uranium. And you can see the graph of uh, production till the end of mining. Uh, during the uh, active ISL operation, we drilled in this area more than 15,000 wells. Uh, 8,000 of them were uh, technological wells. It means uh, wells for mining or extracting uh, of uranium uh, because uh, in 60s, 70s and 80s, we didn't have uh, uh, the technology of submersible pumps. And uh, that's why the so-called airlift mining uh, was used. Uh, to to get out the uranium from the underground and for this technology it's necessary to to have uh, this huge amount of of uh, wells 
the area of leaching fields at the end was uh, about six and a half square kilometers. And during the active operation, it means about 30, more than 30 years of mining, uh, we injected into the underground uh, about uh, 4, million, uh, thousand, um, 4 million tons of sulfuric acid, uh, 300,000 tons of nitric acid, uh, more than 100,000 tons of uh, ammonium ion, and uh, we use uh, for cleaning of the boreholes and wells from some precipitate silicates, uh, we used uh, hydrofluoric acid and we used more than 26,000 tons of hydrofluoric acid. So uh, why the uh, legacy or the, the burden is so big, uh, so huge in, in Strash, uh, it has many factors. Uh, the main factor was that uh, everything was made really fast, really quick, because uh, we needed, or uh, the, the target was to produce as much uranium as possible in very short time. And uh, that's why we started very quick without, uh, without experience, uh, without any reference to post-closure remediation. Uh, but the biggest problem was the near existence of two totally different mining methods. Uh, then uh, some deficient exploration or, and verification process, uh, inappropriate well construction, inappropriate hydraulic regime in the area of leaching fields. And uh, we have to say that all these uh, causes uh, had several environmental impacts. And this is important. It could be could have been eliminated by a correct and responsible approach before or during ISL operation. So Horace said that ISL is a good method, but uh, it must uh, be done properly uh, and uh, very uh, safely. Uh, this is a schematic cross section of the area. And uh, you can see the problem of the two different types of mining method. On the right side, there is a deep mine. And on the left side is the uh, in-situ leaching area. Uh, and both these areas need a totally different uh, hydraulic regime. So it means a totally different piezometric head of the, of the water. In the deep mine, you have to pump a huge amount of water pump out from the from the area because you have you need to have dry area there uh, for in situ leaching and uh, uh, in this case it was uh, airlift mining so you need to keep the uh, piezometric head on much higher level uh, maybe it could be better seen on the on the next slide. Uh, oh. So here is the area uh, of the deep mine, and here is the area of uh, in-situ leaching. The distance between these two uh, parts is about two kilometers, and the difference in the, uh, in the water level is about 100 or more than 100 meters. So that's why the acid solutions from the ISL uh, region uh, flew in the direction to the deep mine. We changed the uh, direction on, of groundwater flow. And uh, now we have uh, contamination out of the area of, uh, of the leaching field. So in the area without wells, boreholes. So with very uh, low possibility to pump it out from the underground. So uh, it is the first and biggest problem, two totally different types of mining method. Uh, next problem is uh, an appropriate hydraulic regime. It means in some places we injected more water than we pumped out, which caused the escapes of the uh, acid solutions in uh, other parts or outside of the area of leaching fields. Uh, the next problem was that we started uh, in the 60s and 70s, we started with the so-called first generation of wells with uh, only single casing. Uh, it means a one pipe through uh, the horizon with the drinking water 
to the Cenomanian aquifer where the uranium ore is. And if the pipe uh, was crashed somewhere here in the Turonian aquifer, uh, all these acid solutions flew out or escaped to the area with drinking water. So the next slide shows you the regional geology and hydrogeology here. Uh, the uranium mining took place in the Strash block uh, in the uh, lower Senomanian aquifer. There we have three aquifers uh, in some places. The Turonian is the upper aquifer with uh, drinking water. Then we have Senomanian aquifer with the uranium ore. And uh, behind this Strash fold in the next block, Lustes block, there is also the Cognac uh, aquifer. Uh, so, uh, which is uh, what is really important in this case is that the uh, lower Senomanian aquifer is uh, confined. Uh, so the groundwater is under high pressure there. Uh, the upper Turonian aquifer is uh, unconfined and it can cause uh, big problems uh, if we stop the remediation. Uh, then uh, it can cause that the acid solutions from the Senomanian aquifer can overflow to the Turonian aquifer because uh, the geology of this area is very complicated and there are many geological faults and uh, volcanic rock dikes. Uh, so each red line and violet line uh, can be a problem in the future that the... Uh, acidity or the, the acid solutions can overflow to the Turonian aquifer and can damage the uh, source of drinking water in the Turonian aquifer. Uh, one of the problem could be uh, also the uh, quantity of old wells and boreholes. And again, each well can be in the future a source of problems. Uh, if it is not liquidated uh, properly, properly uh, there can be a communication between these two aquifers in the future. These two aquifers, the Turonian aquifer and Cenomanian aquifer, are uh, divided by aquitard, uh, by aquitard, which is non-permeable layer. Uh, normally it's non-permeable, but uh, as I told you, it's a uh, uh, damaged by many faults and many uh, old wells and boreholes. Uh, there are, in Strash and Hammer, there are two types of deposits. Uh, what is, uh, uh, or there are two types, the simple type, uh, which is on the left side on this picture, uh, this is one reason uh, why we use these two different types of mining because the simple type is, uh, there is a much easier to use the uh, deep mining method. So it's much easier to drill the shaft to the horizon with, uh, with the uranium ore and then extract the ore and bring it to the surface. Uh, the second type, this is in Strash, uh, is a so-called complex type. And uh, there uh, is then much easier to use the in-situ leaching uh, method because you can see that the uranium uh, ore is uh, spread out more in the in uh, more layers. And so on. That, uh, it was one of the reasons why we use these two types of methods or two type of methods. Uh, the second reason was that, uh, as I told you, everything had to be in, uh, done very quickly and nobody cared about the future. Uh, the ore grade is very low in both cases. Uh, this is a sedimentary uranium uh, in sandstones and uh, the leachability of this uh, rock, of this uranium is very low. And it was the reason why we use the uh, acid leaching, not alkalic leaching here. Uh, both aquifers were uh, damaged somehow. So uh, the upper Turonian aquifer with the drinking water uh, was uh, affected only uh, locally. 
mostly by accidents uh, or leakage from the from the pipelines or or from the uh, crashed wells. Uh, influence volume of groundwater in this aquifer is uh, more than 80 million cubic meters, uh, and total amount of dissolved uh, sulfates is about 20,000 tons. Uh, the main contaminants in both aquifers are sulfates, aluminum, and ammonium. Uh, sulfates is, uh, are there from the reaction uh, of uh, sulfuric acid with the rock environment, and uh, aluminum uh, was leached out from the rock and uh, ammonium ion, uh, uh, it is a problem because uh, it uh, comes into the underground from the surface technology of precipitation of, ammo uh, of ammonium duranate, which is the yellow cake. And uh, from this, uh, we have a problem that the ammonium uh, is in underground and it's not easy to uh, clean it. Uh, the product, productive aquifer, Senomania aquifer, was affected in an area larger than 26 square kilometers, which is uh, four times more than uh, the area of leaching fields. Uh, the, the influence volume of groundwater more than 380 million cubic meters and uh, total amount of dissolved sulfate, uh, 3.6 million tons. So the concentration, the average concentration uh, in uh, the area of leaching fields uh, after the mining operation was uh, 50 grams per liter. In some places, it was up to uh, 70 grams per liter of uh, sulfates. Uh, for the uh, remediation, uh, or the, the process of remediation is really necessary to prepare some risk assessment. And uh, the first risk assessment was uh, made in 1997. Uh, 1997. Uh, in 2011, it was very important for us that uh, according to the risk assessment, we set the target values of uh, remediation parameters. And uh, it means that our target uh, value of or target concentration of uh, sulfate is six grams per liter. Uh, now we are on the state about uh, uh, 30, 35 grams per liter. So it's a, a very uh, long lasting process and, and very difficult. Uh, the main objectives of the remediation activities are uh, to clean the underground, uh, of mostly the Senomanian, uh, Senomanian aquifer, uh, to the state guaranteeing uh, continuing usability of Turonian aquifer. It means that we have to clean it uh, to the state that will ensure uh, that the acid solutions, which can in the future uh, overflow to the Turonian aquifer, cannot damage the sources of drinking water in the Turonian aquifer. Uh, the next objective is to decommission boreholes and uh, surface installations, which is now uh, about 7,000 boreholes and wells and about 700 uh, surface installations. And then to do the uh, reclamation and recultivation of the surface. Uh, for these targets, we use two types, two main uh, methods of remediation. Uh, the main method is pump and treat. So pumping the contaminants uh, from underground uh, to the surface installations and uh, reprocessing uh, it to uh, industrially usable products, which is for us uh, alum, uh, ammonium, aluminum sulfate, or uh, uranium still, uh, or ammonia water, or uh, to reprocess is to the uh, ecological storable products, which is filter cake, cake uh, from neutralization technologies. Uh, this filter cake is stored in the tailings pond. Uh, 
The second and uh, for us quite new method is uh, in situ immobilization. Uh, it means that in some places where the pH is higher and the contamination and concentration is lower, we can inject the uh, uh, alkalic water from the neutralization technology, uh, which will increase the pH in the underground to some four and uh, or four and a half, and then uh, it will start the process of uh, precipitation of hydroxides there in in the underground, and it can uh, immobilize uh, the the. Uh, contaminants there uh, directly in situ in the underground uh, forever. Uh, this is a complete scheme of the neutralization technologies we use now. So we still uh, pump the solutions, acid solutions from the underground, and they still uh, contain uranium. Uh, so we have to separate uranium. Uh, today, uh, we uh, produce about uh, 20 to 30 tons of uranium per year. And then we divide the uh, solutions without uh, uranium to three uh, different ways. Uh, the strongest, more, most concentrated are going to evaporation where we uh, thicken the solutions four times. We separate the water, which can uh, be discharged into the river. Then we uh, crystallize ammonium aluminum sulfate from the solution. And uh, the last step after crystallization is neutralization of the residual solution in the neutralization uh, technology. Uh, then we have next two parts of the solutions. The middle concentrated are going directly to the neutralization station in the S10. And the last one, the uh, low concentrated solutions are mixed with the Turonian water and tailings pond water, and they are neutralized in the uh, smallest neutralization station in the S6. Uh, for neutralization in all three uh, technologies, we use uh, uh, lime milk uh, to increase pH and to precipitate uh, all the contaminants. Uh, as I told you, the filter cake is stored in the tailings pond. We have there uh, two uh, parts of tailings pond. Both of them have uh, less than one square kilometer. The first part on the left side is filled with uh, 13 million cubic meters of uh, the residual material after processing of uranium uh, ore from the deep mines. And the, on the right side, this is uh, part uh, which is prepared for the 7 million cubic meters of uh, neutralization filter cake uh, from neutralization technologies. Uh, after the end of, of uh, remediation process, all parts of this tailing pond will be covered with some uh, material, with some foil and then some uh, soil, and it will be uh, grassed over. Uh, the uh, remediation started in 1996, uh, but we didn't have enough technologies to uh, be fast. And uh, that's why we separated only 10 to 20,000 tons of contaminants per year. And it was very slow. That's why in uh, 2010 and 2012, we uh, built a new, two new neutralization technologies. And uh, with the whole uh, technological uh, complex, we are now able to separate up to uh, 180,000 tons of contaminants per year. Uh, so with this amount of contaminants separated uh, per year, we are able to finish the uh, remediation uh, till 2000. Uh, 37. Uh, necessary for the uh, remediation process is a uh, monitoring system. Uh, this is focused on current status of groundwater and contamination in uh, Senomanian and Turonian aquifers. 
uh, we uh, used together about 2000 wells uh, for the monitoring, uh, for groundwater level monitoring, 600 measured wells. Uh, for the contamination development monitoring, we use uh, conductivity logging and we use 722 wells. And then we uh, use four uh, more than 400 wells and 13 surface places for uh, sampling. And we are doing the chemical analysis in our uh, certified laboratory. Uh, for the sampling, we use all these methods, airless sampling, submersible pumps. Uh, we also can uh, use zonal sampling and we uh, also uh, analyzing the core from a new boreholes. The sampling frequency uh, in both aquifers is uh, different uh, one times per month to half a year. Uh, sampling frequency in tailing spawn area and from surface water is quarterly. So uh, to conclusion, uh, we suppose that we will finish the remediation of underground in 2037, according to the mathematical uh, modeling results. Uh, the following uh, remedi uh, reclamation of the surface uh, will continue till 2042. Uh, the total cost of the whole remediation process are expected on the level of 2 billion euro. Uh, so as I told you, it's a, a long lasting and complex process. Uh, and we are, we are controlled by all authorities you can imagine because our owner is, or our, our founder is a ministry of, uh, uh, of industry. Uh, but we are controlled from the Ministry of uh, Environment. Uh, we get money from the Ministry of Finance and uh, we are under control of the water authorities, uh, Czech Mining Authority, uh, the uh, Czech uh, Office for Nuclear Safety and so on. And uh, I know it was very briefly, we, we went very briefly through uh, the... Uh, through this, this very complex and uh, difficult process. So if you would like to know more and to get more information, you can uh, visit our school or you can visit the course of our school, Training Center World Nuclear University School of Uranium Production, uh, which was founded in 2006 and we are under auspicious of World Nuclear University in London and we cooperate with many, many partners, universities and uh, uh, international uh, organizations. Uh, so we organize courses, one to four week long courses uh, on all aspects of uranium cycle. And it's all, thank you for attention. Thank you, thank you Volko. Uh, we are really on the, on the mark. So uh, Karen allowed us one question, and there is a question from a uh, Sabrina, Sofia Mino, and she asked you about uh, what is the source of aluminum as a main contaminant in the, um, in the process? Uh, aluminum. Yes. Yeah, uh, the aluminum uh, was leached out uh, from, the, from the rock environment. Uh, this is uh, the concentration of the aluminum there is not high, but uh, this contaminant, it's not uh, so easy to uh, get out from the from the solutions. It's the same problem uh, like with the ammonium ion. Uh, but ammonium ion and uh, let's say nitrates are there from the surface technologies. So we added the contaminants into the underground. It's not naturally, aluminum and other contaminants, and there are all, all elements you can imagine uh, leached out from the rock. So aluminum and these contaminants were leached from the rock environment uh, by using uh, sulfuric acid, because during mining operation, we used uh, uh, the sulfuric acid with concentration 50 grams per liter. So it's really acid. 
the mm -hmm. pH during mining uh, in the underground was less than one. Thank you. The same problem we see in some uh, acid mine drainage situations, even in, in waste rock piles. So uh, with that said, I pass it on to uh, Nick to introduce uh, our next speaker. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Horst. And thank you very much, Vojta. Very, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce um, the third speaker, Tamsin Macbeth. Uh, she is uh, a senior vice president and remediation practice leader for CDM Smith. Uh, with over 20 years of experience in contaminant treatment technologies. Her work leverages her interdisciplinary academic and research background, uh, mainly focused on microbiology and engineering uh, to advance remediation uh, technologies. She has served as principal investigator, manager and or technical lead an advisor for government, private uh, sector, and international PFAS contaminated sites that need uh, characterization and remediation. <clears throat> so she's going to present uh, the talk about innovative approaches to treat groundwater. And Tamsin, please take it from here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with everybody today. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some advances in treating groundwater uh, for contaminated sites. You know, we've been treating complex contaminated sites for many decades now in the U.S. since the, you know, late 1970s, early 1980s. And we've learned a lot about how to treat groundwater um, we've also learned what the challenges are in treating groundwater, uh, including things like persistent sources of contamination that could include mixed phases like napples and waters, mixed contaminants, um, complexities in, in the environmental conditions uh, that you're trying to achieve that success, uh, which is driven in many cases by the site physical properties, um, and then a topic I'm gonna to talk a lot about today, and that's the impact of emerging contaminants. So in our industrialized societies, we are realizing over time that a lot of the chemicals that we use uh, can be toxic. And so I'm gonna talk about, you know, how we are looking at treating um, multiple types of sources that have mixed contaminants, um, and including emerging contaminants. And I'm gonna focus a little bit today on a hot topic of, in the US, which is PFAS or, or per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And the reason these emerging contaminants are really prevalent is that since about 2015, the US has been doing a lot of sampling and analysis looking for PFAS in drinking water including drinking water aquifers or groundwater across the US. And what they found, which is shown on this map, is that these chemicals are really found across the US. They're found at military sites, they're found at drinking water facilities, they're found uh, across all other types of sources. And functionally, these chemicals are organic chemicals. There's a kind of a chemical structure here on the in the upper right hand corner where you've got a carbon compound um, that has chains of carbons that have fluorine um, and then have different functional groups. So these chemicals were used extensively starting in about the actually late 1800s but really came into significant production in the 40s um, in large part, one of the largest first applications was actually for uranium enrichment. So uh, these chemicals have a, a lot of different types of properties. They're in general surfactants. So they like to partition to different interfaces like air and solids. They can be hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Um, and they that carbon to fluorine bond is the shortest and strongest bond to carbon in chemistry. Um, so because of their extensive use and production, um, we are, are seeing them. And then 
Recently, in the 1990s and early 2000s, it was determined that some of these chemicals are toxic uh, and impacts like increased cholesterol levels, changes in liver, um, increase of kidney and testicular cancers was observed in populations that had been exposed to high levels of these chemicals. So in the US now, there's been a whole series of regulations that have come out to really target these chemicals, including a most recent proposed groundwater drinking water standard or maximum contaminant level uh, of four nanograms per liter for two of these chemicals known as PFOA and PFOS, in addition to four additional chemicals, um, including PFNB, PFNA, PFHX, and Gen X. So uh, in addition, as I mentioned, these chemicals have been used extensively in many different industries. Um, oops including, this is just some of the suspect industries. They've been used in firefighting foams, in metal plating, in the oil and gas industry, in paper and packaging, in electronics, in mining, and as uh, I mentioned, in uranium enrichment, which is important from a radionuclide perspective. So we anticipate that a lot of sites, and we're seeing across the US, a lot of our radiological impacted sites are also impacted with these emerging contaminants. Now, moving to treatment, uh, because of the, their widespread prevalence in our drinking water sources, there's been a lot of work done uh, to understand how we can remove these contaminants from our drinking water supplies. And three primary technologies have come as proven technologies, and that's using largely sorptive or exclusion technologies like granular activated carbon and on exchange resins and membrane technology to separate or remove the PFAS from different water streams. And the selection of treatment technology is really driven by water quality at the end of the day. So it includes things like PFAS as a whole is a class, a, a very large class of chemicals, depending on how you uh, define it. it, could be upwards of 12,000 and count, counting different chemicals. So which of these PFAS are you really targeting for removal? Uh, what's your maximum contaminant levels? Again, in the U.S., these standards are coming out to be very, very low in the low nanograms per liter range. Are you treating other constituents, things like metals or radionuclides that you want to remove in these systems? And then what are the potential interferences uh, or uh, foulants that affect your treatment processes, things like hardness, metals, carbon, all of those things affect the performance of these technologies. So there's also been a lot of work looking at advancing these technologies by developing innovative formulations of carbons or anion exchange resins, uh, looking at novel sorbents, there's a lot of work uh, being done evaluating things like biochars, surface modified biochars, surface modified activated carbons, specific anion exchange resins, and then mixed minerals, things like aluminum oxides, iron oxides, and silicates. And this is just some data here showing removal effectiveness of PFOA. Uh, with these different activated carbon sorbents and novel sorbents. So when we look at having to remove mixed contaminants, uh, we can also look at modifying some of these sorbent materials like the activated carbons, uh, but through uh, the manufacturing process to affect the specific surface area, the pore structure, the look at surface modifications, as I, as I mentioned, both surface oxidation and reduction, uh, looking at various modifications, again, to really target those chemicals of concern that you're trying to remove or treat, like chlorinated solvents, petroleum hydrocarbons, PFAS, metals, radionuclides. In addition to modifying the uh, properties of the different sorbents, there's also a lot of work being done combining these different types of chemicals. And this is just an example that 
we've compiled of some groundwater treatment technologies where they have developed amendments uh, by combining these activated carbon compounds with things like zero valent iron, um, which can be used to treat chlorinated solvents, um, uh, as well as uh, combining it with things like uh, chemical oxidants um, and uh, also modifying the properties of the activated carbons themselves to create things like nanoparticles um, or submicron particle suspensions to more effectively deliver these constituents to contaminated groundwater systems. But because of the complexity uh, in terms of the performance of these amendments uh, and their reliance on the groundwater chemistries, when you're designing treatment systems, it's really important that you're doing bench studies and pilot studies to really get comparative assessments of the performance, the removal performance, and of these different sorbents. And so uh, one common method, and there's been a lot of work published on this, is to use rapid small-scale column tests to understand things like breakthrough of short-chain PFAS to understand and compare directly the performance of activated carbons and anion exchange resins, surface modified uh, amendments and novel amendments, um, and understand the effect of the water chemistry like the total organic carbon or pH or metals concentration on the removal effectiveness or radionuclides for that matter and understand the need for pretreatment. So at the end of the day uh, for these treatment processes, we're really looking at ex situ treatment. Uh, this is just a typical process flow diagram where you are extracting groundwater. It's pumped to an above ground treatment system and then depending on what your removal pretreatment processes are and removal processes, uh, you're migrating through that treatment process. So that's sort of what we're going to be focused on for the remainder of the talk. Um, however, the limitations of these conventional treatments, these sorbents, you know, anti-exchange resins, carbons, membranes, is that they all generate high volumes of spent media or waste. And that's really important when we're looking at life cycle costs, particularly if we're also addressing things like spent media that are impacted by radionuclides. Um, so there's, you know, also significant pretreatment costs, significant waste uh, disposition costs. Um, and then often you have to have uh, very high removal efficiencies to achieve those very stringent and very low uh, concentrations uh, for PFAS in particular, and radionuclides for that matter. So a lot of the focus now in the engineering and the science uh, around treatment processes is developing treatment trains, which can first separate uh, the different constituents or contaminants, then concentrate them, um, and then ultimately destroy them. So in the case of PFAS, the goal for the, those emerging contaminants is to remove them entirely from the environment. Um, another kind of novel treatment technology that's had a lot of work done is uh, to take advantage of the PFAS surfactant properties um, and to use what's known as uh, foam fractionation. So PFAS, because of their, they have an affinity to partition to air water interfaces, which is shown in the figure on the bottom. So they'll actually, uh, we take advantage of that and develop aeration systems that bubble air through water columns and the PFAS partition uh, onto those bubbles. And then it rises to the surface. And because PFAS are surfactants, they often form foams. And those foams can be removed uh, at the top of the water column and uh, there's been a lot of work done both defining the air water interfacial sorption of PFAS, the uh, charts that I'm showing on the right are some examples of the air water interfacial sorption coefficients for some of these chemicals. And of note is that those air water interfacial sorption coefficients actually increase 
as concentrations of the chemicals decrease. So we're able to achieve, again, very low concentration, like nanogram per liter concentrations with the technology. So in addition, as I mentioned, the ultimate goal is really destruction of PFAS. And so there's a tremendous amount of work being done right now on destructive technologies. And so this is where we have as practitioners really gone back into our toolboxes. Uh, there's been a lot of work done for other contaminant types looking at technologies like electrochemical oxidation, plasma technology, UV hydrated electrons, sonochemical, hydrothermal. And now all of these technologies are being explored for their effectiveness to uh, destroy PFAS. And I'm going to go through a few of these destructive technologies that have been shown, at least at the bench scale and kind of progressing to a pilot scale to work in removing um, and treating PFAS or destroying PFAS. So the first is plasma technology. Uh, this converts essentially water into a reactive environment of heat, UV radiation, and highly reactive chemical species, such as hydroxide radicals and aqueous electrons in this plasma. Um, this is, these systems have been modified by, again, um, bubbling uh, either argon or air through the water streams, bringing the PFAS to the surface, and then applying uh, high voltages or discharges between two electrons to create the plasma, which then breaks down the PFAS. In addition, electrochemical oxidation has been used. This is a destructive technology that uses an electrochemical cell and generates a current between a reactive anode and cathode. Um, this degrades PFAS through two mechanisms. One is anodic oxidation, which is shown in the figure, or a direct electrolysis where PFAS adsorb to the anode and are destroyed directly through a direct electron transfer process. That's the process that we like uh, because it degrades things like PFOA and PFOS, which have those low uh, maximum contaminant levels. But this also creates hydroxide radicals that can break down things like PFAS precursors and AFFF foams, which are used for firefighting. Uh, the next technology is UV hydrated electron. Uh, it relies on generating, again, a highly reactive reductant generated by a UV photosensitizer to reductively defluorinate a wide range of PFAS, as shown here. Um, Sonolysis is the next technology. This is a destructive water treatment that can use sound waves to generate microbubbles or cavitation where PFAS compounds uh, can be degraded. Uh, as the cavitation occurs, micro bubbles are generated, as is shown in the figure, um, and these bubbles will subsequently collapse and causing a local rise in temperature, uh, which is what breaks down the PFAS. And then last is hydrothermal alkaline reaction. Uh, this is a technology where, as shown in the figure at high pressure and temperature near critical hydrothermal conditions, water properties, including the dielectric constant, uh, ion self disassociation product, and density change and creates a reactive environment which can catalyze reactions. This was actually developed originally uh, for things like biomass decomposition and reformation, and now has been modified uh, through adding a caustic that uh, that then facilitates the degradation of PFAS. So what do all these treatment technologies or destructive technologies have in common? This table summarizes these technologies I just shown in terms of the systems, the PFAS that have been degraded or shown to be degraded, the volumes that have been treated with the technologies to date, the orders of magnitude reduction in PFAS concentrations or ohms, and the treatment time to achieve those reductions. And collectively, we actually use a parameter um, called the EEO, and this is the amount of electrical energy that's required to reduce the concentration of the contaminants in these bench and pilot studies. Um, and so you can see here the EEO values 
uh, are reported in watt hours per liter of water treated. And in general, destructive technologies uh, have been in the tens to hundreds to sometimes thousands of watt hours per liter. And when we compare these numbers to other technologies like our conventional approaches, the reverse osmosis or ion exchange technology, uh, you can see that uh, they are orders of magnitude higher. Those separation technology are usually on the hundreds to tenths of watt hours per liter. Um, and so these destructive treatments, when we translate that to say a 1 million gallon per day treatment plant um, with a treatment technology that's 10 watt hours per liter, that would uh, result in a 1.6 megawatt of power per million gallons per day treated. And so it makes these destructive technologies very impractical for large scale water treatment. And so again, that's why really a lot of now the technology and the research and development is in combining these approaches. So combining reverse osmosis or membrane technologies or the surface active foam fractionation uh, and deve developing or generating waste streams or concentrates where then it becomes practical to treat with the destructive technology. And so this is just sort of a process flow diagram showing a concept uh, where you're uh, reducing or treating a PFAS impacted treatment strain. And in fact, this one was actually also impacted with radionuclides um, using the surface active foam fractionation approach with electrochemical oxidation and polishing. And so with that, I'll just acknowledge, uh, you know, I talked about a lot of different treatment technologies. Lots of folks are working on these treatment approaches. Um, and some of the data that I showed. And uh, with that, I think we will take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Tamsin. Very <clears throat> interesting and important um, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I do have a very quick question. I know that we are running out of time. I was in. I was. Uh, I know that you have done a lot of work in the DoD sites and others, but I was wondering whether there is any studies look that has looked at the Department of Energy here in the United States sites contaminated with uranium or with other radionuclides. Whether there is any ev <clears throat> evidence of the presence of the PFAS in those sites? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so the Department of Energy has been doing a lot of work in the last couple of years, evaluating all of their historical uses that could potentially be uh, the heavy <clears throat> fast chemicals. And they actually just published a historical use guidance document and uses summary that's on the DOE's PFAS website uh, that goes through the processes that they have identified as using PFAS, and it's it's a lot of the things I talked about. They've identified things like uranium enrichment, you know, as a a key process that use these PFAS chemicals. Fire training facilities or firefighting facilities. A lot of process chemicals in existing treatment plants, you know, have used PFAS, um, and so there is now a lot of guidance in how DOE uh, wants to evaluate the uses of these chemicals and, and document that so that they can make uh, assessment and remediation decisions moving forward. Thank you, Tamsin. Um, I don't see any other questions. Horst, you might have any or should we- There is one. On? There is one here. <clears throat> I can okay. take it. This is Leroy Stefan. Oh, address it to everyone. Maybe Tanzan would like to take this one. Um, yeah, just gave a philosophical box. Box. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Philosoph yeah, thanks. A philosophical question. Our ability to find solutions to emerging contaminant is juxtaposed by the speed that the new chemicals are being developed. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the future holds in terms of chemical development over the coming decades, but do you have any thoughts on how we can stay ahead of the curve in terms of finding uh, effective treatments? Well, this is really thought-provoking. Thompson, would you like to take this one? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, excellent question. And and I've had many of the, the same thoughts. You know, when we look at the way our science advanced new chemistry, um, that science advances and still does to this day much faster than our ability to really understand the potential toxicity of the chemicals that we're generating and using. In addition, right now, a lot of the ways that we're screening new chemicals um, is by just evaluating their structures against known chemicals to see if they're structurally similar or have other um, properties that might suggest they're toxic. So it's sort of this empirical, you know, screening approach um, that is really sort of the gatekeeper, right, in, in acceptance and use of new chemicals. So I expect that, um, you know, we are learning uh, through our uh, experience with, you know, things like petroleum hydrocarbons and then chlorinated solvents and, and now PFAS, right, that there is uh, unintended consequences of our industrialized societies and, you know, in terms of, you know, how we can respond to these, I think PFAS is also a good example because in reality, you know, it took us, you know, 20 to 30 years to really develop a lot of the regulatory processes that Chris talked about for how to manage these sites, uh, to develop technology that can be used to treat these chemicals. And we really applied all of that experience in the PFAS space in the US. And I would say we've made more progress in advancing technology. You know, what took us 30 years to do for chlorinated solvents, you know, we've done in like five years for PFAS. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think we are learning and I think we are doing better and responding. But similar to PFAS, I think Philosophically, we also need to ask ourselves the question of whether we need to be, you know, more judicious in how we are, you know, accepting new chemicals coming into the marketplace. Because um, ultimately the source control and preventing the use of toxic chemicals is a much better way to protect the environment than to try to treat the environment once the chemicals are already released. Yeah, that's a good good answer. And thank you, Tamsin. Um, fascinating. Yes, yeah, it, is, it is fascinating. Um, and and one other idea is that you know the the MCL for the for the PFAS is, is pretty low, is in the parts per tri trillion, you know. And uh, the instruments that most of the people have in the laboratories probably are not able to detect, you know, those small um, quantities. Um, so what do you think, how can, can people actually use or, you know, come up with some methods to determine the presence of these PFAS in, in the contaminated environment? Well, I'll take an initial stab at that. Um... Right now, the US EPA is undergoing, you know, has validated methods for detecting PFAS. Uh, EPA method 533 and 537 are used to assess PFAS in drinking water. And the detection limits for those methods are around the four nanogram per liter. The proposed MCL uh, did account for or take into consideration current analytical methods. Um, when we looked at the health advisory levels EPA released last June for PFOS and PFOA, that, that, and which only takes into account sort of how they're extrapolating toxicity, um, those values were in the part per quadrillion. Yeah. And so, you know, we obviously can't measure that, right, with any kind of analytical chemistry. And so now when EPA released the proposed MCL, they basically released it at the detection limit of those current analytical methods. Right, right. Yeah. I think it's a fascinating. I know we are on the top of the hour uh, on the mark, so to speak, but uh, I need to, 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 to ask this. 
Um, when we talk about um, no radioactive components, we hear about MCLs, but uh, when we talk about radionuclides, it's always a um, very site specific because it will depend on ingestion rates that will be uh, preponderant in the particular situation. So uh, the question here is that uh, Thompson just proposed this uh, um, separate, concentrate, and destroy, which is up, does not apply to, to, to radionuclides. So uh, my question, uh, Thompson, to you is making a parallel, uh, and also I can extend this to Grace and to Voco, but maybe we can start with you. Making a parallel with these uh, um, radiation protection principles that we need to justify the, the, the intervention in a kind of um, cost-benefit analysis, uh, what could you tell us about uh, how this overall philosophy can be applied to situations like contamination by uh, radionuclides? We don't really need to go that low, but we need to make a kind of a balance between the projected health effects and the the benefits that can be observed by treating the water. And eventually we may decide that not treating is the best uh, solution. Yeah. So when we're looking at mixed contamination, like radionuclides, I think uh, in the engineering design, it's really sort of considering what the overarching goal are and, and you know, what levels uh, the system is impacted with the radionuclides. I mean, I would anticipate, you know, that the traditional technologies that can address radionuclides would still apply. So the separate certainly still applies, you know, with things like sorbents and, and membrane technology, um, and perhaps even the concentrate uh, components, right, where you would you know, concentrate um, those, but certainly obviously not the destruction piece, right? So if you were looking at those waste streams, I would say you would wanna look at those in sort of compartments and probably design the system, right? To achieve the uh, goals for the radionuclides in the earlier steps of the process, right? And then, um, and then how you could do the PFAS destruction uh, at the end of the process. Chris, you want to add something? Well, I just say, <clears throat> I mean, I think um, approaches like adaptive site management and looking at end states, right, are going to help with this in terms of what's the, the shared vision or, or, you know, values. And, um, you know, I, I would totally agree that, um, you know, when, when, remediation started back in the 1980s or so let's say um you know the idea is here's a remediation goal you go out and clean it up clean up every last piece right i think that perspective has probably changed into more of a risk informed uh, decision so you know what's the what's the risk what's the end state how we how do we want to use the the waters the land um i think those things really should be factored in so that's my two cents. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I think that um, Karen is still here. Uh, I think that we should actually wrap up, Karen. Very interesting presentations. Yes, and and I think it's um, unfortunate we didn't have more time. We had such great content, and I appreciate the people who have stayed on past the closing time. So um, we actually have still a lot of people with us. I do appreciate everybody's attendance today. Thank you so much to our speakers, Chris, Vota, Tamsin, uh, to Kelly for running things behind the scenes. Uh, we will be posting the recording and the slides uh, on our website and through the Environet as well. Um, and we look forward to seeing folks on August 15th. We'll be sending out some information about that next uh, seminar that'll focus on the remediation of soils and sediments. Horst, any uh, closing comments from you? Yeah, thank you. I, I guess that uh, all webinars give us, uh, each app webinar gives us the opportunity to have a takeaway uh, message or something that we need to think about. 
and I confronting the presentation of uh, vocal and uh, what uh, Chris mentioned and also in relation to what Tamsin, uh, we need to really uh, have good considerations in the uh, comparisons and in the analysis of the philosophy that is used for treating water contaminated with radionuclides and water contaminated by non uh, radioactive species because definitely the decision making process directed to each one of them has some peculiarities and uh, specifically when we talk about new chemicals that we are not uh, really dealing with right now. I like the question that was asked. Um, I think we need to, to dig into this and to find some sort of, uh, you know, um, some, cons some proper considerations that um, we might not think about when we just concentrate our efforts in one particular class of contaminants. I think that for me, what's very refreshing to see this perspective, once that I'm very much stuck into the world of uh, radioactive contamination, where most of the things that Tansen just mentioned is, can have a very important contribution to the way we see the, the issue. So uh, it was really fascinated. Bocco, I really knew his presentation is an amazing work they do in, in Czech Republic. I would have some questions to him, but uh, that can be <laughs> come later. And thank you also to Chris, to Chris, to to highlight the, the the things we we need to consider when establishing uh, a treatment system. This is very important for our audience to to have in mind. So thank you all for this opportunity, and uh, we will work with that content in our first future activities. Definitely. Right. Thank and you very much, everyone. We're submitting an abstract to our Remplex Global Summit, November 13 and 17. We really yes, and see you all here. That is a joint event with IAEA as well. So Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Nick, I'll stay on a few minutes if you want. Sure. Okay. Ota, thank you very much. I know it's a, it was a, you have a training course this week, is that correct? So you were fitting this in around a very busy schedule. Uh, yes, yes. We started uh, yesterday a uh, training course. With, uh, now we have 10 African people 